Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. All right. The stream is active. We have liftoff. Piece of, oh, the chat. I didn't see. I didn't start the chat. Uh, the chat box or whatever they call it. Peace and love, everyone, if you're tuned in, uh, if you're just getting in the room. Which you're probably not even there yet. <clears throat> Sit up, get my posture right. I'm gonna get my posture right. All the streams seem streaming. Good, good, good. We had some technical stuff yesterday. It didn't affect anything, but it was worrisome before we started. There's a lot going on here with streaming to multiple channels at one time and all that. So if you are tuning in, thank you. I appreciate you. This is Hip Hop Can Save America, the podcast, the live version, live for the month of September, Monday through Thursday. So this is our last show this week. We got a couple next week, and then this experiment, this grand experiment is over. Uh, but lots of episodes to run back if you haven't gotten to uh, check them out. Please uh, consider doing so. Whoever is tuning in now and trickling in, please say hi in the comments section of whatever platform you happen to be on. Uh, it kind of gives me a little peace of mind that everything looks and sounds good on multiple platforms. So say hi. Hi in the comments. We're about to start our show. Uh, we've been having guests uh, appear live for the whole month, talk about the intersection of hip-hop in different areas, including science and technology, which was yesterday's kind of angle, uh, education, fine arts. Health and wellness, health and wellness, including mental health, uh, which will be a focus of today's show. Uh, and unfortunately, just talking to associate producer Cindy on the on the back here. Unfortunately, mental health and issues surrounding that field are relevant today. As they have been uh, far too often. Particularly uh, if you you know, have any kind of understanding or connection to the social justice issues that we're facing in this country, politics and social justice and or lack of social social injustice, as it were. So anyway, that affects people's psyche and it affects people's mental state. And we will talk about some of these things, uh, uh, I believe, today uh, as we await our guest to arrive in the green room, as it were. And for you all to, uh, you know, trickle in and populate these live streams. Once again, live uh, Monday through Thursday for the month of September. Some great conversations have been had so far. And if you don't, uh, also you can subscribe to the pod, uh, the podcast also. Uh, it's the same thing. It goes to pod, but we actually put more stuff out on the podcast feed. So you might want to do that too. So uh, who's checking in? I see uh, I see Jay Webb. Uh, check this out. Uh, shared this. Always sharing. Thank you very much. Silent Night. Once again, <clears throat> Innocence Project Ambassador, hip hop artist extraordinaire, uh, front man of the band Cole Fuse. Shouts to the band Cole Fuse family. If you guys are checking in, band for Cole Fuse has a real cool online streaming thing. Also, uh, once a month. You could uh, check that out. Was that me? I heard myself. That's weird. Oh, okay. They can't hear you, so you're okay. Uh, and we're just waiting. We're just giving a little time before we start the show. Let people watch and tune in. So just, you know, put us on. Get your lunch. Pull up. Put your feet up on the desk. Turn off your spreadsheets and your work at homes. If you're working at home, if you're privileged to be working at home. Talking to my daughter. My daughter's in Atlanta, and uh, she's she works in food service, so she has to work out out in the world, which worries me, of course. But it is what it is. All right, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to get started. I'm still waiting the guests to arrive. That usually gives me a little more confidence. I don't have a lot of information to share with you guys today. Other than that, what I do like to share sometimes is other interesting 
news tidbits that are happening in hip hop, uh, intersection of hip hop in these different areas. You guys hear background sounds? I have my window open today. I don't normally do this, uh, but I wanted to get some air in here today. So that's what I'm doing. Let me put some important links as we about to get started. There's a couple of links that are important. <clears throat> Alright, let's just see what happens. Let's roll the dice. It's the hip hop way. Alright, so ready for the theme song? And then we'll start talking about some stuff, and then uh, I'm assuming our guests will join us very shortly. It's going to be a very vital conversation, so definitely worth the wait. Definitely worth uh, you checking in and staying, staying tuned in. Say hi in the comment section, and uh, let me know uh, how you're feeling. All right? It's a loaded question these days, I know. All right. Let's get going. I'll do a recap of the month so far, and then we'll uh, keep an eye out for the guest. Theme song time. <clears throat> the thing about hip-hop uh, today is... It's smart. It's insightful. The, the way that they can communicate uh, a complex message in a very short space is, is remarkable. And a lot of these kids, they're not going to be reading the New York Times. That's not how they're getting their information. My hip hop will rock the shop the nation. Pop culture is more than music. Peace to you and speak the truth. Show them what peace can do when they're at least for you. My hip hop. We'll block the shop the nation. Rap is something you do. Hip hop is something you live. So hip hop didn't invent anything, but hip hop reinvented everything. Yes, indeed. Check one, two, check, check. Uh, we're back live. Hip hop could save America, the podcast, live Monday through Thursday. For the month of September 2020, it's your man Manny Faces uh, running this show. Uh, we have been doing this for almost the whole month. Somehow or another, this has worked out uh, better than I expected, to be honest with you. I appreciate you guys for tuning in and checking us out. You might be watching on YouTube. You might be watching on Facebook. Uh, you might be listening on the podcast feed, which is fine. Uh, if you're on the podcast feed, swing on over maybe to uh, hiphopcasaveamerica.com slash live. And there's a couple of links where you could actually watch the video version of this. You could watch it live, uh, you know, one. PM Monday through Thursday for the rest of the month, which is just like three days. Uh, and then you could, of course, uh, you know, watch the back episodes if you'd like. If you're watching on the video, either Facebook or YouTube, uh, I invite you to sign up for this as a podcast. Uh, so it's the same thing. We put these episodes up. <clears throat> excuse me. We put these episodes up on the podcast feed and then we drop actually other episodes as well. Some interviews that were done uh, before video. And you know, so we just, uh, um, doing that. So uh, you can go to hiphopcasaveamerica.com. You can go to Apple Podcasts. You can go to uh, Spotify. You can, wherever you get podcasts, you'll be able to find this show. So I do ask that you do that because you will get those kind of bonus episodes. And then when this run ends, uh, you know, when this run ends at the end of this month, which is next Wednesday, I think. So we have like three more shows to go after this. Uh, we're going to continue feeding the podcast feed with interviews. So again, if you like intersections of hip hop and other aspects of society besides entertainment. So, you know, again, education, health and wellness, science and technology, the fine arts, politics and activism and social justice, spirituality, uh, which we delved into a little bit this month. All these things, all these weird combinations uh, that are being used to, in most cases, improve humanity and uplift society. That's the angle we take and the stuff we like to focus on. So that's where we want you to be. The podcast feed, once again, Hip Hop Can Save America. Dot com or just search for Hip Hop Can Save America um, wherever you find podcasts. Again, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I do thank you for sticking with me. I've been watching the the numbers, and it's not all about numbers. It's kind of about impact, and, and we love to make sure that some of the information we get has been used. I've seen some of that come in, too. I've seen connections already being made uh, from some of the people that we've had on and some of the audience members linking and finding ways to either work uh, together or, you know, collaborate or just be aware of, of the work that they do now and connect. So that's super important to me. I'm really um, happy that that's a thing. And so, again, uh, trying to make impact, 
the best way possible. What you can do is two things. Number one, if you support this work and say, man, this CNN looking thing is so fancy pants and, you know, Manny has really nice hats. Uh, the, 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 the Patreon won't go to the hats, I promise. And by the way, my guest has impeccable taste in hats, uh, but the Patreon money will go to the fancy pants. So we have distribution. We have, you know, uh, the, the multi-streaming costs, uh, the subscription fee. There's the podcast hosting and all these things. Of course, uh, associate producer Cindy uh, doesn't do this for free. We don't make people work for free. That's ridiculous. So patreon.com slash Manny Faces if you think this uh, work is valuable enough to help out. But I know how things are right now. I certainly don't expect that you necessarily have to do that. The best thing you can do then is just share it. And you can share it right now. I mean, you can just hit wherever you're watching, you can share. And uh, that's just as valuable to me. But no, go ahead, share it. I'll, I'll wait. It's fine. So thank you for doing that, uh, if you did that. And if you didn't, it's fine. No one knows. Uh, we're going to keep on going. I don't want to keep you waiting too long. Uh, again, sometimes I like to sprinkle in some news that's happening that you know has inter inter interesting intersections of hip-hop in it. Uh, but this whole episode is actually a very, unfortunately, in, in some ways, a very timely uh, current event front of mind kind of thing. Uh, as you can see on the screen, Dr. Ian Levy is joining us. Uh, the, the general subject matter, again, set way in advance, mental health, counseling, young people, uh, you know, especially uh, school counseling, his fields of expertise. Uh, and then, of course, we have kind of a moment in America, a oft repeated moment in America where our mental health is being tested uh, on a widespread basis, uh, some more than others, uh, and rightfully so. So, so how it worked out, I'd like to introduce uh, and welcome back to Hip Hop Can Save America. Uh, he's a, an early guest coming back like he never left, uh, Mr. Ian, Dr. Ian Levy. How you doing, sir? I'm good, man. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Right. It's a pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you back in the day, uh, one of the early OGs of this show. And uh, so I welcome you back. I think you're the second repeat offender. So there we go. Yeah, McCall I'm ready. McCallumine, I think, uh, was the first. Okay, so, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. Well, you know, good company. Hired uh, gun is a necessity. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, it's good to see you, sir. Uh, good to see your face. We haven't seen faces, uh, you know, in real life, uh, but it's good to see your face and not just mm -hmm. your Twitter feed or something. Uh, <laughs> I hope uh, all as well as can be uh, with you and your family and health wise and all that. Thank you, man. Same to you. Yeah. Same to you. So, uh, for those that may not be familiar with your work, the last time we talked, matter of fact, you were doing all kind of totally different things. You were in Massachusetts at the time, I think. Uh, you were doing uh, stuff up there. Uh, since then, you've moved uh you know career locations i guess uh you put out an album like what the hell <laughs> doing, doing a few things man um my work i think sits at that intersection right uh i'm an mc uh, i know for instance like hired gun who we just mentioned from new york city's hip-hop scene right and so right. for me like Everything I do, I think, stems from, or I try to make sure that it stems from something that hip hop has taught me or communicated to me as being important. Yeah. And uh, so continuing to engage in my art is necessary for my own mental health because um, it helps me process things that are happening for me and we'll get into that yeah. um, in a bit. But also it informs my, my scholarship. Like what am I doing with young people in terms of interventions? What am I writing about or doing research on in terms of my writings? and peer-reviewed journals and books and all that stuff. How is that related to though ultimately and situated within like the beauty and complexities of hip hop culture? So yeah. I've been doing all that stuff. I'm back in the Bronx now. Um, I was in Massachusetts in Boston, just outside Boston for a year for my first gig as a um, school counselor educator. Mm. So I worked as a school counselor in New York City for around five years. I moved to Boston for a year. Now I'm back. I'm at Manhattan College um, okay. in Riverdale where I'm training school counselors, right? Uh, to go into schools and be great. And part mm. of what that means in my mind is, is using hip hop based interventions yeah. uh, to support youth. And we'll get all into that, but that's kind of where yeah. I am career wise and situated. Yeah, yeah. What is your, obviously things have changed because of the pandemic and, and especially how it's affected the education sector. Uh, what sort of does your day to day look like now? What yeah, you, so well, it's it? literally right here <laughs> where I am. So <laughs> right. I'm in my living room, right. uh, slash like office, make, slash. slash office, kind of. <laughs> yeah, you know, hence the whiteboards and whatnot behind me. Um, shout out to the container store. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I'm here, you know, like uh, at home, and so my day to day is really I teach cl graduate classes online. I taught last night 
for back to back. So it's like four hours. It's a heavy mm. lift, but, but a good one. Um, and I'm trained I'm teaching two classes. One is like a traditional research class with school counselors, mm-hmm. helping them do research projects. The other one is a, uh, internship. So all my school counselors are doing their internship placements at schools around the city, um, which are mostly remote at the moment, um, because of the state the status of DOE schools. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm glad that they are remote because it's a healthy thing to do. Okay. Um, but it's but there's a difficulty as well with that, of course. But anyways, it's um, I've been training sort of school counselors as they engage in, in this work. Um, and then I've also been doing a lot of like consulting with schools, helping them do like hip hop programming, been using some online um, mediums to do that. I don't know if you're familiar with Soundtrap. Yeah, there's ways to like live about, record. I've been yeah. hearing about, a lot about it lately. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's a great way to like engage with youth regularly online in this virtual space using Zoom to share screen and share sound and play beats and yep. write and like kind of engage in the creative process online as best as we can. So I'm still kind of pushing the work um, yeah. in so many ways, but just online and from this seat that I'm in. Yeah, I've talked to a couple. Actually, we've been kind of education minded this week. I, I try to mix up a lot, but education is just a, a big part of you know where hip hop intersects with society to improve society. So we've had a lot of that. Uh, Dr. Nate Novato, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Tasha Iglesias was on, and and we talked about the difficulties that online learning, distance learning, especially when you you know, especially with you know, kind of the work you do, it's so well not with kids directly, young people directly, but the idea is that it's so personal, it's so one on one, it's so in course. the space. But at the same time, as teachers and administrators and parents are all freaking out, like how do we you know how do we do this now? How are we going to flip it and make it work? We're also hip hop. So it's like, well, we just remix it. We'll just flip it. Like, just this do is it. how we do it. We'll yeah. find a way. We'll find a creative way. Soundtrap. We'll find the resources, you know, that maybe even weren't even designed for this application. Right. And so I think in some way, the hip hop minded folks in the education space kind of have a leg up on that. I, I would agree. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I mean, ready, ready to shift, always shifting, always right. pivoting. I yeah. think that's the nature of hip hop. Right. And so if you're used to that and ready and willing to do that and believe in your ability to do that. I think that's also what's really key. Hip hop teaches us to believe in our ability to be like, okay, yeah, things are all over the place. Let me figure out another way. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Something out of nothing ideology. And so it's like, you know, um, yeah, I think there's a huge advantage to people who identify with hip hop and young people are going to resonate with it. I think you made a really good point. Like if it feels real. Right. And so like, how do we still create spaces virtually that feel real? Right. Can you still feel that uh, empathy, right? Can you still feel compassion and understanding? And of course you can, right? It's right. just in our diet. It's a lot, it comes back to, I think a lot of our like ability to dialogue, right? Our ability to communicate that we understand and we hear mm-hmm. people for the complexities of what their experience is. Um, that's just at the core of the whole thing. That's, that's the core at, of the whole thing yeah. is empathy and connection, right? Yeah. Within a world that has clearly continuously demonstrated a lack of empathy and connection and understanding. Yeah. Um, how do we do that within session with young people, I think is, is really important. Um, and how do we train professionals to do that too? Yeah. For those, I, a lot of, you know, I, I always wonder, and I got to do like a, a survey at some point, you know, who's listening to this show? Mm-hmm. You know, I think mm-hmm. sometimes it's people that are totally on board, know this stuff, and they just get inspired by going down sort of the inside baseball rabbit hole of, yeah. of the praxis and how we do it. Uh, yeah. But I also love the idea that, you know, people who don't know much about hip hop, except maybe on a cursory level, but may be involved in mental health or mental health therapy yeah. fields or, or just the betterment of society stumble upon this and say, wait a minute, hip hop, I know, but you don't, but you might some, and then mental health therapy, counseling in session with students. I know these terms, just real basic, you know, elevator pitch. Yeah. And, and maybe one or two quick examples of the kind of things you teach counselors to do. What is this merging of hip hop and, and mental health therapy, especially for young people in the school counseling setting? Totally. So when we think about counseling generally, if we just start there, one of the things that we know is that there are not enough approaches to counseling that are like culturally responsive or sensitive, right? Right. So most of the forms of counseling, if not really all, were built for and by white folks. Um, And so they're just not, we we try to use them, right? We try to take different types of therapies and approaches to counseling to schools with non-white folks and they don't work. Um, and oftentimes we then blame the people for saying, well, they're not asking for help. They don't want to be helped when in reality, mm-hmm. not. It's the system is not situated and structured in such a way that help is provided. So in comes hip hop, right? right? In the midst of that lack of access, 
go up to a lunchroom in a school where you're trying to deploy an approach to counseling that is not culturally responsive and you find a bunch of young people around a table banging a beat out and rhyming and if you listen critically if you can actually listen to what is being said beyond right. maybe some curse words or you know some things that maybe you don't want to hear if you listen you hear you hear happiness, you hear joy, you hear pain, you hear struggle, you hear all of these types of emotions that you want to emerge in traditional counseling sessions. Right, right. So I think it's this understanding of like, okay, in the midst of, and this is classic hip hop, like we were just saying, in the midst of kind of like disorder and, not, and the lack of like adequate sor- services or resources being provided systemically, yeah. hip hop finds a way to provide that resource. And so I would say, I would make that argument, that lunchroom cipher, and ciphers generally have functioned as a form of group counseling for people that identify with hip hop mm-hmm. amidst the lack of group counseling forever. Right. And right. like, so, so self, uh, self-imposed counseling, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. People get vulnerable. People get real. I, I've, I just did a, a series of interviews with MCs about like their experiences in ciphers. And they all talk about how like, there's a vulnerability. They all talk about like blacking out within ciphers where they uncover something that they didn't even know existed within them before. It's group therapy. I gotta There's say, no doubt. I gotta say, I, I don't mean to interrupt the flow. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm a, I, I've emceed in my day and I, I, I never thought of this suddenly popped in my head. I remember being in a cipher in like, you just have the bedroom studio and, you know, we'd be sitting back doing things and, and me and my guys ciphered uh, and, and somehow the theme of it was lying in the grave. Mm. And we were looking back on our lives and th- that's went on for like an hour. And the, it was, you know, with that same theme and it was so crazy to, you know, to sit there. And again, at the time I was you know, 21, 22, I was young, but, I, but that kind of thing where you're saying, Hey, I'm being introspective. I'm being, I'm really taking some deep concepts that I bet you my parents, a counselor, a therapist would have loved to have gotten out of me. Of and here I was offering it up and, and the people I was with. The same kind of concept. That's it. And that's happening everywhere. That's happening in lunchrooms. And what do counselors do? They go up to the lunchroom and they pull somebody out of that to take them down to their office to give them group counseling that ain't even close to (laughs) resonating in that capacity. Right. right. So the so the reality is, OK, hip hop provides this like you just beautifully said, like in in dorm rooms, in apartments in in just like hangout spaces outside of any traditional schooling space like where there's access to the to two services. Yeah. And so I would I would make this argument and I have in my in my writing and this is sort of like the bulk of what it is, is that like you can bring the cipher to the group counseling session. Right. You can have young people. You can give young people a theme like lying in the grave or like feeling disrespected or, you know, um, I mean, pick any theme that's sort of relevant. I mean, both of those themes are, you know, um, unfortunately incredibly relevant in this very moment today. And you can take themes that are super difficult to sit with and use them as a platform to write lyrics than to share out within ciphers. Because what do we know about sharing out in ciphers? If you spit a rhyme, even if it's about a super, super duper vulnerable experience, you're going to be met with validation, support, daps, pats on the back, like yeah. words of encouragement, everything in a very different way than if I just started like in regular conversation, emoting maybe that same context, like that same exact set of experiences. It might not be met with the same thing. So hip hop provides almost this like cultural or social, um, socially appropriate space to talk about really vulnerable things. Right. Um, and that's what it means to be authentic or real, right? It's right. like all, and so I, I just think that um, hip hop provides that. And when, when we think about how we include things that are naturally occurring within hip hop or these community defined practices, when we think about bringing them to the counseling session, that's how we elevate it and turn it into something that is culturally responsive. Right. Um, and then it's our ability though, as counselors to be in that space, to listen, and, and ask follow-up questions like after the cipher, like, yo, you know, Manny, I love when you drop that one line about lying in, in the grave, right? And how you, how you detailed it and there was some really dope wordplay. Can you tell me a little bit about more about what you said when you said right. blah, you know? And then now we have conversation, so it can right. turn- The door's opened. Like, door's opened. Yeah. It's there. And every MC wants to tell you about their run. Oh yeah, so. for sure. The break down the line. <laughs> yeah, Let me tell you what it. I did. Let's yeah, see what yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's it. it. And so I 100%. think that that- yeah. So I think that's um, a lot of it, 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 you know, is that work. And uh, and then there's sort of this also this add on sort of component here, um, you know, which is that 
particularly in work in schools, you know, the, you can't write a rhyme if you don't know what you're talking about, right? And so a lot right. of people in, in just generally, right, if you listen to Jay-Z verses, you listen to everything, it's super clear that like, if we take Jay-Z as an example, he's done research that has informed his writing. It's personal, but there's also like facts, facts that he's researched that are included within that verse. So there's, it also opens up avenues within the counseling process. If young people are talking about like, you know, systemic like violence that is done onto them how can we now also in you know beyond just sort of this personal reflection on how it feels right pull out pull out books and texts right. and go watch news clips <clears throat> online and, and do the research to then inform the writing of the lyrics so you're yep. also you're, so it's healing as well as it is like understanding the structure and doing research and everything you would want in schooling because that school right. counseling piece is, is often beyond just like the emotional, but also the, right. the career and the academic. Right. Yeah. And we, and we talk about that sometimes there's, there's a few schools of, of thought or schools of practice in terms of hip hop as an educational tool. And you could remember, you know, the rote memorization, the, we could pack a lot of words together, memorize it. And now we know the things, you know, yeah. we, we learned about, you know, Hamilton, you know, you can learn yeah. about, you know, the yeah. founding fathers just by, by learning the songs, you learn a bunch of stuff about what happened, yeah. and, you know, uh, but there are those that say that obviously you can go deeper than that. The science genius program, you know, uh -huh. comes to mind. You can't make a compelling song uh, that can, you know, live, stand up in a battle against somebody else about a scientific or, a you know, a, 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 a biological or a chemical or a physics, you know, some science topic. If you don't have a sort of mastery of that topic. Correct. So it gives you the opportunity to say, OK, I can write things that rhyme. But when I want to write a rhyme, I want to make it a story. I want to make it a narrative. I want to make it compelling. And and, and, exactly. and that's what you're saying, that this that this lets you do go down the rabbit hole. Uh, for the historical context about what it is you're talking about in your rhyme, come back and add that in, and and kids are perfectly willing to do that. Yeah, and and then it supports the healing process, right? Because to pull some, to notice that an issue that you're dealing with is not internal, but it's actually a symptom of an external mm. ill, is so is so liberating. Yeah, right. To know that, like, oh, uh, liberating in some ways, and then also not in other ways, because then you realize how messed up the system is. But on a <laughs> right. personal level, right. It allows you in some ways to let go, like, okay, it, it's not me. Something wrong with me. Right. This is something wrong with the world. Right. And that that's, that's a positive that's a really big moment. Um and uh that I'm sure in some ways we've all experienced, right? Yeah. Like, I, that reconciling. And and it's super important again as we talk about issues and, and the communities that we're talking about. We're not of those communities, but we, you know, are involved in and uh and, and work with those communities and try to help the best way that that, that we can um in our very you know, various fields. Uh, and I want to talk about the specifics, how this ties into sort of what's happening <clears throat> around us. But before I do that, I, I do want to, again, people might be said, this sounds interesting. This sounds like interesting in theory. And they, yeah. people don't realize how much actual work and research and, you know, uh, receipts <laughs> have been collected that this kind of works. Can you just for the kind of for the record, just this, this isn't theoretical. This works. You've seen it work. You've seen it work data wise and you've seen it work anecdotally. Uh, yeah. just some, some example or some, some yeah. way to express that, that this actually yeah. works to help young people in ways that, again, the traditional methods simply aren't able to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, we see as far as like data, I'll do, do a quick data and then I'll do an anecdotal. So like, as far as data works, right. Um, I mean, we've seen, uh, in like sort of analyzing the impact of these different interventions on youth, uh, in, like experimental designs, right? We've seen like increases in coping skills, right? Being able to use lyric writing as a stress coping skill, um, being able to use lyric writing to increase emotional self-awareness, right? The, the really being able to articulate and understand how we feel in, in, in given moments, mm. um, developing a self-concept, understanding like our roots and what has shaped us and, and where we are, where we are and why we are, where we are, right? Like the, all of this has been sort of evidenced in, in data around youth development. We've also seen that youth are able to, when you use this type of work in school, it, it inspires youth to think about how to include their families and their communities and helping build the work right so mm -hmm. we've had full studios built in schools right. that youth have co-created we've had their families their parents or community members come do dj workshops in the school building right. production workshops in the school building um where 
pre-COVID, we're working on um, getting some graph work done within a school studio that we mm -hmm. were building, right? So there's ways that inherently, you, and these were all youth-led. It was like right. through the dialogue and through the conversation, like how do we make this dope it. space? Yeah. Youth are like, oh, I know somebody who does graffiti work. I know somebody who's a DJ. <clears throat> My uncle does production. Like, you know, that kind of stuff. Youth are able to then pull, pull their stuff pull who they are into that space to right. help that process of healing. Come help me create a counseling space within my school. That's amazing. Like, so that I, I hope gets kind of at both, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, like we've, we've seen this work work, um, in many ways. <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, and students have produced, you know, albums that they've, that they've shared with family and friends. Um, you know, I think one of the big things for me is getting, um, like when you're in session, and you, you know, come to some personal realization, I think growth is actually seen or evidenced when you're able to share that realization with the rest of the world, right? So I, I figured out something about myself in session, but I've really changed when I can take what I found in mm -hmm. session and apply it to the world largely, right? So mm -hmm. the sharing of mixtapes, the pub like public listening parties where youth are like, here's this song that I wrote about all of my experiences growing up as an adolescent in the Bronx. And let me not only perform the songs with you, but let's have a listening party where I sit down as counselor and say like, can you tell us what's behind the track? Wow. And they break down the context and showcasing that emotional self-awareness, yeah. that ability to use lyric writing as a way to process a variety of different, um, you know, personal sort of barriers or struggles um, or wow. hurdles in, in, in life, right? And then seeing like, you know, this, this, this anecdotal piece is a little dated, but like when ringtones were popping, I had parents that would set their kids' songs as like ringtones <laughs> on their phone, right? Wow. So like, the affirmation. you just had all these ways, right? That affirmation coming that way. Now it's different. Now it's on SoundCloud or it's on, you know, parents have Spotify playlists right, right, right. with their kids' <clears throat> tracks in it, right? That are talking about like personal experiences that they might not otherwise have known about, right? right. Like mm. that type of stuff that yeah. I think is like, Evidence is the the power of this work, man. Wow, those are those are fantastic anecdotes. You know, to it's again, it, it makes so much sense <laughs> to us. <Yeah. laughs> um, but these are all the things that are the goals. These are what you want in traditional counseling. Yeah, and it, you want and people it, to be able to talk about their emotions, to have coping mechanisms, right? To share with people in their support networks about how they're feeling. Yeah. Hip hop naturally provides all of those things. Right, and again, it's it's an easy entry point. It's you know, every kid plays around, whether you want to be a rapper or not, yeah. every kid plays around rapping, freestyling and making up rhymes. Every kid, you know, kind of dabbles in, in the expressive, na expressive nature of hip hop. You know, maybe it's even, you know, DJing or dancing or whatever, like some aspect There's no kid alive, you know, that probably hasn't dabbled in, in, in some aspect. So the entry point is there. That's the language and the, and the ethos that surrounds them. It's just an easy mm -hmm. entry point. It's no, it's, it, it's not hard to it's get them. To, yeah. And I think that that's a key, there are sort of two key pieces there. One is like, this work is not about making like the, the next group of XXL freshmen, right? right like this right. is not like, I'm not doing this work to produce artists. Now it right. might happen and sure. that's cool. Like if one student, you know, decides that I want to do this and does, does it, that's wonderful, sure. right? And I'm not against that. But the idea is like, this is a tool that has been used for healing. It's not about being the best MC. It's just about vividly describing personal experiences, right. talking about them with your peers, vibing around them. And it provides the second piece. And then um, I'll, I'll pause for a moment, but like, no, no, go ahead. you know, there's other, there are other avenues that folks can tap in. When you make a mixtape, you need production, you need marketing. You might want to do some hoodie designs or some t-shirt designs. Right, you might right. want to do some album artwork, right? You might want to reach out to public spaces so you can help set up a listening party. You might have one person that wants some like, you know, another group member to help like manage them and help them with a social media campaign. It provides avenues for youth to learn a whole slew of skills that are creative, but also relevant to a ton of different <laughs> career angles that aren't even necessarily like music business things. Understanding how to reach out to people to organize an event is a skill that is used across a ton of spaces. Yes. Understanding how to public speak across a ton of spaces, 100%. understanding how to communicate with peers, across it right so like there are so many academic career and social emotional outcomes associated with this work that transcend just like yeah let's make some music um 
<laughs> yes. Our job though, right, is to like advocate for that and understand that. And yeah. so, and I say that because I've, the amount of times that I've been personally, my, me and, and my students have been personally like accused by staff members of just like, oh, like, you know, there's Levy again, like just making hip hop with youth. <laughs> right. You know, it's like not like, it's not just like this, fun. first off, it is fun and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Like Why who not? the hell told you? <laughs> it can't, can't be, be fun, fun. right? Yeah, so one, it's fun as hell. Um, but two, it's also going to allow us to work on everything that you want us to work on within an educational context um, in ways that are more powerful, more culturally responsive and resonate with more young people and help them more post-secondary than like any of anything else that's happening within the school building. So mm. I'm all about it, man. I, I like, yeah. And I can't, and it's our job to advocate for it though, right. because the haters don't understand the work. They right. only understand hip hop as like misogynistic, violent, horrible culture, right? They don't understand it as this really complex, robust thing that can be used for a medley of outcomes. Um, and we need to advocate for that. Amen. Now, listen, hip hop can save America. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Yep. <laughs> That's why we're yeah. doing it. It's been that uh, you, uh, you, uh, uh, you so eloquently described the plethora of life skills that can come out. I, you know, I say this, every failed rapper is a better communicator. Like, yep. I, I don't mean failed rapper, but, you know, someone who really wants to be a, 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 a rapper, like they trying to do it. And then, you know, life gets in a way and you go some other direction. Guarantee they're a better communicator. They're better you know, than they were before they tried. Joe Budden. Yeah. Yeah. Facts. Facts. One hit wonder. Complete revival, phenom in the Spotify thing, revolutionizing the whole game. Oh, invented love and hip hop before love and hip hop was love and hip hop. Yeah. Come on yeah. now, that's a, that's a fantastic. That's everything. Right? Yeah, and and you can get all of this. I, I love the way you say that. Putting together the album requires all these different aspects of <coughs> business, communication, negotiation. It's you know it's all there, and um, and 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 that's you said it better than I could. So. I'll just, nah, I'll just man. rewind it and then yeah. play it again. Um, my notes are on the floor because this is crazy here. Uh, but I'll, I know the question. There's been a lot of talk lately about the state of, of the music sort of on a mainstream level, corporate control, mm. what the masses get. And, and that's a rabbit hole that I, I never really want to get into here. It's, it's barbershop talk. It's all subjective stuff. And, you know, old hip hop, new hip hop, today's hip hop, old hip hop. I just kind of, I leave it for a different discussion. Yeah. But, but specifically to the angle that we're talking about now, uh, mental health, mental health therapy, mental health, care, meth, mental health issues. Uh -huh. You know, the, the adage is that uh, hip hop used to be, about, this is a terrible thing, but people say it. Hip hop used to be about selling drugs. Now it's all about taking drugs. Uh -huh. But if you peel back that onion a little bit, I think what we're getting is that young people now, whether they're talking about taking drugs or, you know, using drugs to, you know, lucid dreams, rest in peace, uh, juice world, you know, things like that. You're hearing a, a little bit more of this, the kind of stuff you're talking about that comes out in counseling sessions that you wouldn't normally hear from artists. And I think sometimes the mental health babies being thrown out with the mumble rap bathwater uh, where people aren't recognizing that a lot of young artists are actually telling you some real ish. Everything. Everything. Give give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think there's definitely been a shift in terms of mainstream culture, and we won't go down like the rabbit hole of that. But yeah. and there's some for better or for worse thing. I'm not advocating yeah, everything. For sure. It's a longer conversation, but there we have to, and that and that's worthy. But that you know that's a whole other hour mm -hmm. we could do on that. Mm -hmm. But but this idea for this transition from selling to taking, I think, is notable. Yeah. But there are a few transitions, right? So shout out to my my colleague Edmund Adjapong. We've been talking a lot about this. Um, there this shift in not only from selling to to taking, but from hiding emotions to exploring them. Right. Um, from there were notions for a long, long time in hip hop, and they're probably still there in, so, in in some way. That like, if you talked about your feelings, you were like weak, right? And yeah, there was this notion of like being hard versus yeah. being soft, exactly. And so we think about that, right? Like a great example of that in my mind is like think about LL Cool J, and how much everybody was telling him he was soft because he was like making songs for the ladies. I need love. Now you have Drake who's like <laughs> crushing the whole game and doing right. the same thing, right? He's right. making songs. And, and I like Drake, like I personally. Sure. But like my point is, is that there are similar 
be, they're similar artists in many ways. Um, they exist in different moments of time in time. And w Drake was kind of in the middle. He was critiqued for being soft. There were all those memes when memes first started popping about like Drake's the type of dude who would <laughs> you know, like wear a cardigan. Shout out to the cardigan, right? Like like these all these ways of of of, of calling soft Drake. wearing a cardigan. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. What you exactly. Doing? Yeah. Like all of those things were 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 sort of Drake was critiqued for, right? right? He was critiqued for being soft. He kept pushing that though, and he's super vulnerable. And then you saw like, I mean, you could track this throughout. I think Kid Cudi is like an incredible example. When I think about lucid dreams, I think about Kid Cudi's. Right. Uh, um, oh, come on. Uh, no, what's the so soundtrack to my life? The right. soundtrack to my right, life. Right, right, right. Al uh, alone in my room and soon I'm consumed by my doom. Right. Like all those lines where he's talking about emotions and there's this shift. I, I, I think that he's a, he's a real big part of that and deserves yeah, a lot of credit I in that so shift. Too, yeah. But there's been this shift in like, I'm going to tell you about what I'm feeling. And yes, drugs are being utilized more and promoted more in the industry, but they're also being taken more by young people. But why, right? Why is that happening? Well, societal ills have continued and the lack of adequate services to process emotions in other ways have right. also been stripped. Right. So what you gonna do? Right. Like you're gonna do like, in my mind, you know, like I'm listen. I'm wearing a Mac Miller self care t shirt, mm. and Mac Miller passed away from drug use, mm. and like, we we can blame individuals, like we can blame you know um, Juice World for for taking pills, and and we can blame Mac Miller, and we can, but but I'd rather blame the fact that like society at large has not created adequate outlets to sort through and talk right. about emotional stressors mm. while also asking people who engage in hip hop to be hyper vulnerable. Mm. Um, and so I think that like, we can't have it both ways. If we're going to have people say like, yo, we need you to open up. Like we need, we need counselors. We need mental health professionals. We need people who are trained in helping professionals generally to offer adequate services so that youth can like what I have, you know, said some of the outcomes of this research are learn that like, I can, you know, make a full mixtape when I'm dealing with a bunch of things and process that way yeah. um, and talk about that with some support groups that I have and go share it in ciphers or go to open mic nights or go to New York City events that we know exist. Like shout out to all those, right? Yeah, yeah. How do I go to those to share and find community and build community as alternatives to the use of, yeah. you know, drugs as a coping mechanism. Cause I truly look at drug use as just a coping mechanism and utilizing what is available when nothing else is. Right. Right. And that's a systemic <clears throat> issue. That ain't a person's issue. Right? right. You know, we talk, they talk about the, you know, SoundCloud rap and the, you know, the hazy, you know, drug use and, the, you know, the, but there's so many, again, so many vulnerabilities are coming out. So many young artists are not afraid. To me, I just think it's 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 yes. a it's a it's a, a monumental shift. So many, uh, Cindy in the chat uh, in the comment room, I mentioned Earth Gang, Dreamville, like you know, a lot of yeah. artists are actually again not running from these things. There, there may be a line where there's some like that's the cool thing to do now, but. Isn't the cooler thing to isn't it better that the cool thing to do is express your emotions and be vulnerable? Uh, you know, you see this again. You see shows like Euphoria. Yeah. You you see yep. people getting into this and 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 I I, I don't know. I, I I look at it like I just don't want to turn our ears off to the young folk expressing themselves through music because the music may not be our to our taste. Yeah, we have to be listening to this for the intrinsic intrinsic value. That's what we ask of people when they see hip hop. Don't look at it as just this little thing. Look at all this beauty, but then we can't do the same thing to the young and folks who try to tell us. And that's what we ask in counseling. Right. You know, if, you're do, if you're doing like rehabilitation counseling, you're not gonna say, all right, come to the session, but don't talk about your drug use. <laughs> right. Like, what? <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense. So we want, the beauty about hip hop is that youth's experiences regardless of what influences those are going to be expressed authentically in session. Right. So if you have a young person that comes in and they're spitting rhymes that are super homophobic or misogynistic or talking about drug use, I would argue I want those things to come up because now we can talk about them. Right. Right. Like if I right. say, if I take an abstinence approach and I'm like, no, nah, don't talk about any of the things that you're working on here. Right. Only talk about like, you know, right. You know, like if, you, if you pull out a George Carlin right? yeah. list yeah. of Come things on. we can't talk about in therapy, then there's no point in doing therapy. Then there's no point in doing therapy. The the idea and the beauty of it, and this is a complex argument yeah. to make when you're in schools, because 
principals yeah. are gonna be like, wait, you're gonna be talking about especially like, high this school. Stuff you might get a little yeah. you know, the college level. You can kind of be you know a little bit more. But it's necessary, right? Yeah. Because we can't deal with stuff if we're not talking about it. Mm. Things have to emerge and come to the surface for us to deal with them. Yeah. And hip hop is that's its purpose is to bring stuff to the surface, right? And so if we allow that to happen, and then we have folks that are there to talk with youth and work through it. And then you create mm -hmm. follow-up songs, right? Like you take the same beat, play it back, and like talk up, like write a new verse about what you learned after writing this last song and exploring right. it, right? right? There are so many fun and unique ways that we can do that work. Yeah. But I, so I think that we're in long-winded way of agreeing with you, man. Like we're in a place right now where young people are telling us they're begging to be heard. They're telling yeah. us what they're going through. Yeah. And we can either respond by saying, we don't like what you're talking about, or <laughs> right. we can respond and say, I want to hear more yeah. and so we can talk about it and work on it and work through it. Speaking about what what's happening, uh, if you're just tuning in, by the way, live, uh, Hip Hop Save America, li streaming live Monday through Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern on Facebook and YouTube. Also available as a podcast, uh, hiphopcasaveamerica.com for all the info. Uh, speaking with Dr. Ian Levy, uh, a, an acclaimed uh, uh, professional in that covers a lot of uh, mental health therapy, school counseling issues, uh, and, and those intersections with hip hop uh, to really create valuable connections with youth that have led to impactful uh, uh, and uplifting engagements, you know, with it, along the way. Um, we've talked earlier about how COVID and, and coronavirus has changed everything. We've seen these flare ups in America when social, you know, social issues of social justice have come up, when police killings of, of young black and brown mm -hmm. uh, men and women have come up. Uh, we've seen that those are, are tinder boxes, not just for uh, uh, you know, protests in the streets, uh, protests online, like, you know, protest companies, even speaking out people getting off the couch and saying, Oh, I didn't really, I didn't really realize this was a thing until, uh, the police was on the man's neck and I saw it, but okay. Like, all right. If you didn't see it before now, at least you're here now. Young people, young people of color specifically are absolutely going to, yeah. let me take it back a step. You wouldn't be surprised if a veteran of a war came back and was using drugs you'd be like well of course you know ptsd the, the 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 veterans aren't giving the proper adequate care young people are saying man we're going through all this too we're going through ptsd we're going through weathering there's all kind of things happening to us every day and then these flare-ups happen first of all how uh disappointing or discouraging it is that you can't be in front of young people at this point in time or at these points in time because of everything that's going on. How important is it that counselors continue to reach out to young people, particularly young people of color going through the ramifications of what's happening? And how do you do it in this new landscape? And, yeah. and, and what happens if we don't? Yeah, you know, it's a lot of questions there, and I kind of yeah, no, 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 and I mumbled I, I, through it, but you don't know understand what I'm trying to get at. No, I appreciate it, right? And I and I think that when so a couple of things, I think when we say young people of color, I think what we're specifically talking about in this instance, as it pertains to George Floyd, are, are young black men, yeah, and women, right, and Breonna Taylor, and of course, specifically within the last seventy two hours. Yeah, and so I hours, think yeah. I think in our work, you know, with black youth in schools right now. Um, I think that it, there needs to be an acknowledgement of what's happening entirely. Um, and we need to figure out ways to foster hope um, as hard as and as difficult as that is. Because mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a really fearful time right now. Right. And um, if we get stuck there, then I don't think that's going to help a lot of things. But I think that no, understanding that PTSD is not just an experience of a war veteran, right? right. Um, that there is a lot of trauma that is on vivid display for us right now right. Um, that is directly impacting the black community more so than any other community. And if we're able to reconcile with that, if we're able to notice that and acknowledge that, um, in conversations on, on a personal note, right. But then also in conversations with young people, yeah. um, that, that acknowledgement I think is huge because it's been something as you've just stated that has been not acknowledged, even though it was right in our face. Right. Um, and so it needs to be. And then additionally, how can we use, how can we leverage, um, you know, mixtape making online right, right now 
to do this work? How can we write some songs about what's happening as a means of processing them? Not for right. some like marketing sort of capitalistic ventures, but just on right. some personal note, like how can we support young people and making some own tracks about their experiences and about supporting them in learning and acknowledging these sort of external realities that are impacting day to day living, right? Um, and process those and listen to those for themselves, not for any other thing, but right. just like as a means to process. How can we create little pockets of community online virtually to process this stuff? I think that's right. that's our role and our responsibility right now, particularly as school counselors, right? Is just to be there, be present, to actively listen yeah. and to validate experiences, and then to support making meaning and and engaging in projects that promote joy and and support young people in processing and 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 together like sort of grieving and working through yeah. a lot of the trauma that's being created by these external factors yeah i mean it's, it's an extension of the work that already works uh yeah. obviously uh just anecdotally i don't know if you know I mean, you probably know it's your field uh you know you teach counselors uh but the counselors are dealing with the direct connection with students uh, for the most part this is a silly question i have a daughter she's five so i don't really know how like the older grades are working with distance learning mm -hmm. are counseling services still a part of the distance learning mix just in general yeah yeah they are um it's nuanced and there's a lot of like you know um confidentiality concerns and privacy sure. concerns related to like the online mediums, but it is right. And using yeah. Google classroom, you can still do the work that I'm talking about too. I think also can be argued as like part of larger youth development work. Right. And does not necessarily have to be about like, it's not a, di it, we're not diagnosing, you know, or uh, it's not as close to sort of like mental health and clinical work as it might just be like, social and emotional learning work in schools. Okay. Um, so there's a little bit of a um, gray area there, but I, but, but it's certainly, it's certainly possible to still do this work and to yeah. utilize whatever, you know, they want to say is like asynchronous and synchronous learning online to support right. mixed state making right around right. these really important and, and real issues that young people are faced with. Yeah, no, it's important that it obviously keeps happening, but it, it's, I think, super important, as you said, in the last uh, answer in the last question that is done with that same kind of cultural relevancy, cultural responsiveness, yeah. understanding, yeah. you know, knowing who we are, knowing who we're dealing with and not, you know, not, for, not ever losing sight of that. Um, here's a question. Under the same kind of uh, deal, and then one or two, and then I'll let you go. It's getting getting long uh, because this fascinates all this stuff fascinates me, and, and all your work mm -hmm. is so so valuable to me, man. You know, I, I had a young, I had a young you, son who's older now and was going through some things, you know, uh, during a certain time in his life, and I was just kind of becoming aware of the the work that we did. And I'm like, if I had just if we had done this with him, he would have been fine. We, we would have figured some things out. We would have been able to, you know, do music together. I was producing. We could have, we could have had a, a bonding moment. There were so many things I could have done on a personal level, not in school, not in counseling, as a parent, yeah. as a parent yeah. that understood hip hop. I'm a hip hop guy. I'm a producer and I'm an MC. I'm a DJ. And yeah. this, you know, my kid was coming up and, you know, he probably dabbled in rhyming. We could have figured out a way to do it together if the school wasn't doing it, if we didn't have a Dr. Ian Levy, uh, you know, on call. What can what can parents do uh, in this time when we are also teachers and we're also, you know, working from home or, or, or working out of the home? But someone's taking it's such a complex time for teachers. Maybe, like you say, the counseling, the social emotion development is still happening online for kids. But as parents, we're home with our kids a lot more now. And it's a yeah. stressful situation just because of coronavirus, not to mention all the social justice issues that are happening. What 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 do you what can parents do to kind of yeah. help foster some of this? Yeah, no, it's, it, that's a great question. I think you know the music that young people listen to is oftentimes reflective of their current mental state. So I think that like it's simple, but like starting with show me what you're listening to. Mm. Like let me sit down with my child and listen to some of their music with them, right. and then ask them questions about it. Right. Why, do, why does this resonate with you? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you think this song is about? Why do you like this one, right? Like just using the music almost as like a third party to mm. talk about things that, that, you know, that your child might be going through, I think is, is really useful. And that could, open it, that could open up into a lot of other different things, right? Yeah. Like um, you could very easily, you know, go on to YouTube after you listen to this song with 
with your child and find some instrumentals that connote a similar emotional theme and say, hey, like, let's both try to write a little little 16 over this real quick right. and do that and share it and talk about it. You can, you know, find very cheap, free online recording services right. uh, using a, the laptop mic or a headphone mic right here yeah. and lay down some, some joints together with, with your kid. It doesn't even have to go that far though, right? I think like listening to music together, watching music videos together, digesting the content that that children might be already digesting with them. Right. And then using that as a springboard to have a variety of critical conversations with them, I think is huge. It's relevant. It's going to feel real and authentic. Um, and again, it's not about like lecturing them on like things you don't like in the music that they're listening to. Right, it's about right using it as an opportunity, which I know is like going to be a parent's like go to. And I understand that and appreciate that. Like you see some things and you're like, I don't want my kid doing that. So then you want to lecture them on it. But like, you're not going to twerk listen- together with your kids. Again. <laughs> well, come on. But like listening to it critically <laughs> and having a conversation that then eventually can get to that same outcome, maybe of like trying to not have a certain behavior happen or whatever. But like the goal is identifying these themes Reson- why is that something that we that we like and we you know are listening to and digesting and let's talk about it and let's be critical. Right? I think that's brilliant. Like I said, I I wish I had had that that mindset when I was uh you know uh you know w- with my son growing up. I think we would have had you know that would have been a great tool in, in, to have in the in the tool belt. Um, I had something else I was gonna say about that. Anyway, I think that's a great thing, and I hope parents uh get that message because there is something you can. Oh, I was gonna say. Uh, we're all we're often talking about communities in which the parents grew up with hip hop. Yep. This may be the first time when, like, if my dad tried, like my, me and my point. dad used to have arguments about, you know, the musicality of rap because he was a jazz guy, he was a blues guy. You could see where rap evolved from these things, but at the time it was very, you know, Run DMC. It's tricky, and you know what I mean. Like the beats were just beats, and there wasn't a lot of musicality in it, you know. But I'm like, no, you know, you have, you know, the roots, you know, whatever. Yeah, we had these arguments, but this is the first time maybe that the generation of the you know, parent generation really has the same kind of pop culture DNA. Yep. As so I would is. say two things. One, hip hop is generational, which is something you're pointing at, right? It's been around for long enough that now we have like grandparents and maybe even great grandparents that identify with hip hop, right? We so. have sure. multiple generations of, of, of people who identify with hip hop, which is beautiful. So it's already always, you know, so it's there and it's already potentially sort of an easy place to tap into. But that generational divide that you're talking about, um, I, my dad's a jazz trombonist, so I know that well, right? That, <laughs> yeah. j- that jazz and you know, hip hop divide of like, well, you know, sampling is just stealing and like all of the sort of negative things that that jazz folks oftentimes feel towards um, people who identify with hip hop, right, is, uh, is still perpetuated in different ways, right? Like mumble rap is just the modern day equivalent of somebody who identifies with jazz blaming um, you know, youth who are, you know, kind of sampling jazz records, right? right? So like the, and it's critiqued in the same way, you know, it's a lack of musicality or it's not the same or your hip hop is soft or right. it's not, there's no wordplay or there's no this or no that. Right. So I think that regardless of where you are on that sort of like generational uh, spectrum, there has to be a common ground of understanding, right? Like, and remembering too, like, yo, if you're a parent right now that, and you like hip hop, then odds are, if you're a parent like hip hop, that you felt that judgment from them, right? Like, right. like you know what, you know where that is, right? So 100%. like, how do we not perpetuate that? So I think bridging some of those generational divides is key. And what that requires is like reminding ourselves that like, like we would in counseling, I have biases about what I'm hearing. Let me like put those to the back of my mind for a second and actually try to listen to what's being communicated here. Right. And if we do that, then you hear it, right? And then guess what? Like you can be like, oh, that's so dope. I love what, you know, um, you know, Juice World or somebody else that's popping now, like Corday or like one of these rappers said currently, yeah. um, because it reminds me of right. when Nas said blah. But right. if you are just like, I ain't trying to hear it. Stuff is trash. Listen right. to Biggie and Tupac. Like, <laughs> to them, Biggie and Tupac are trash. So, like, you know right. what I'm saying? So, like, how do we, how do we create these divides? And we create these divides by finding commonality creating empathy, not judging what each other are digesting, and then, and then sharing, because there's so much beauty. Obviously, like Nas and Biggie and Tupac are dope. Obviously, Juice World was dope, RIP. Corday is dope. Like, there, 
hip, it's hip hop. It's always dope. There's always complexities. <laughs> There's always value, right, right. right? How do we find that and talk about that without letting the judgments trickle in that prevent us from understanding the value? I love it. We don't have to go to the same concert together, yeah. little man. You know what I mean? But we <laughs> could, but we could find some commonalities, or at least I can understand what it is that you get out of that. I don't yes. I don't care if I mean I don't care if it's music. If you get a if you're watching a TV show that I think, you know, you're just into like, well, why do you like that? Why I just want to find get a better relationship with my kid, you know? And I think parents can do that very easily, uh like you say, through hip hop because we all know hip hop at this point. And the yeah. other thing I like to say is uh we do talk about the importance of this uh for communities of color for black communities. Uh but this is also kind of universal. Like yeah. any any parent, any kid White, black, Hispanic, and, you know, whatever. Wherever you come from, indigenous, uh, you know, Polish immigrant, it doesn't matter. Your kid yeah. likes hip-hop, bro. <laughs> yeah. Hip-hop hip hop has grown so much that it is universal, right? Yeah. And I think that it can be used for a medley of different reasons um, and just requires that acknowledgement. Like how, and how are we using it differently, right? I mean, not to get... If we go down this rabbit hole just for one more second, right? Yeah, yeah like, it's important. You no, know, if I'm a school counselor right now in an all white school in Westchester County, I'm using hip hop to work on racial identity development and to reconcile right. with racism and, and cultural and, and awareness and understanding yeah, yeah. and how and how issues are perpetuated, right? So like I'm not using hip hop to like make a bunch of young white people feel like they can be like hip hop artists and right. further bastardize a beautiful culture, right? Like there are differences and there are nuances in how we use the work that can all be used for and towards equity and inclusion, yeah. anti-racism, whatever right. word we want to associate with this, right? I think that like this can be used in different spaces differently. Yeah. And um and it take and, and it's because of the vastness that is hip hop. Right. It has the potential to be utilized in different spaces with a level of criticality regarding how it's used. And how it's digested by the community. Yeah. Never forget the roots, man. Never yep. never lose sight of, of where from whence it came <laughs> and from whence it came. That's not yeah. a word, but you know. <laughs> Y'all got the PhDs. I just run the podcast. Listen, uh, I appreciate you. Lastly, before we go, sir, uh this is the world's smartest hip hop podcast, if you don't know. So you know, I got more uh, PhDs per cap per guest capita than anyone. I'll take that's that's my pride and joy because y'all are smart as hell. Uh, but y'all hip hop, so it's all good. Amen. I love it. Um, lastly, tell us about this album. Oh yeah, I don't want to. So, I don't want to forget that. Yeah, no. So thank you for um, of course creating the space for that. So yeah, I um I put out a project in May uh, called And Then It Glistens, which is an eight song project that I made over the course of two and a half years or so. I made the first song that we started this interview, a little talking about my career journey when I got to Boston. So when I moved out of New York City for the first time, I hit my producer up and I said, yo, I'm feeling super like isolated and kind of <laughs> lost out here. Can you give me a beat where I can talk about that stuff? Wow. And then he sent me a beat and I made the first track. And yeah. then, then I was like, I need to feel happier though. I need to focus on some positive things. Can you send me a beat for that? And then I made a second song, right? And it kept, kind of kept going, right? So I got married. I said, yo, I want to talk about that. Can you make me a, can you make me a, <laughs> like literally this is, so I use, so I, it, it chronicles this kind of two year journey. Um, the track list of the album is in chronological order in which they were made. Mm. Uh, so they're like, they literally follow just the two and a half. It's, years mem it's a mini memoir. Yeah. It's a mini memoir. It's eight tracks long. It's called and then it glistens. Cause I learned throughout this process of journeying and self exploration, how important it is to just like step back and kind of focus on the simple and the small things and appreciate things more. Yeah. Um, and so there's a line where I said, uh, it's about my wife who really kind of helped me realize this, um, where I had a line where it was like, Shorty told me better listen or you gonna miss it the way the sun, it hits the window and then it glistens. That's how mm. you win this. Mm. Right? So that's the line, which is just this like, if I can just slow down and pay attention to the small things, uh, like throwing the tennis ball with my dog or whatever the heck I'm doing, right? right. Like there's a lot of beauty um, and so that's the reminder. That's the project. The, the project is, is, is trying to remember the small moments of joy yeah. um, amidst it all. And that those are actually really what matter more than anything else. And um, mm. so that's what it is. Eight tracks long. It's up. It's on all streaming platforms. Um, I really am excited about it. It came out in May. Um, 
And then I have a, a, a new like single actually coming out on uh, uh, October 2nd. It's okay. already up on DistroKid, so it is ready to go. It will become live on October 2nd. It's called Ahead, which is kind of continuing in this same sort of line of thought. It's a song that I wrote before this semester started amidst all of the craziness that is 2020. Yeah. Um, just trying to figure out like how to focus on what's ahead um, and, and, and maintain a sense of optimism in moments where it's really hard to find that. And so that's kind of what the song's about mm. and uh, trying to explore that for myself. And um, anyways, that's coming out October 2nd. So, Hey, listen, that's needed. It. I'm gonna listen yeah. to it. I, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to be uh, optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to be honest. it's super hard. Yeah, of uh, course it is. Yeah. And then the last, like I said, the last 36 hours, it really like, you know, if you have the same kind of interests and connections to folks that, you know, I think, you know, we do, uh, it, it it puts a wrench in the works, man. It really, you know, tears at your gut. And um, it's, it's a really, it's been a really tough couple days, man. And, yeah. But, um, yeah. hey, I guess you got to keep, you know, keep on pushing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. well, listen, you, sir, uh, do provide optimism. Uh, you also provide actual uh, help. You know, as I, I think I said in the original episode, I'm, I'm freestyling now, but I think the, in the episode I described all the things you do. And then I and I said in like in the intro and then I said and he's like helping kids a lot. Yeah. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, that is as valuable as it gets. Well, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, and man. and it's it's hip hop though, right? Like I'm I'm just a um, I I I run to make that super clear because you know, and I know what your intentions are, but I just know the world and academia. Academia is so focused on trying to be like so and so created this and invented this and la la la, and like yeah. the whole game around hip hop approaches is all about trying to say who the originator was, and it's like, listen hip-hop therapy or approaches to hip-hop and counseling were created by a bunch of people in the Bronx in the 70s that we don't know the names of on right. some street corner who hopped in the first cipher, right? And like, it's beautiful. And so I think our responsibility as we work to support youth and their development is to remember that hip-hop has everything we need, right? And if we just step back and honor that and allow hip-hop to manifest organically and authentically, then amazing things will happen, right? Um, and it's really about kind of, I think, trusting in hip hop and the power and the beauty of hip hop. Well, thank you for answering the last question yeah. before I asked it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you before, you know, how can hip hop, this is the name of the podcast, Hip Hop Can Save America, and it's lofty, and how could that possibly be? And I think you articulated it fantastically. So that's it. Uh, thank you, man. You are yeah. uh, certainly an example of it, and, uh, and I try to be uh, the same thing. I think we operate uh, in, with some, you know, mutual DNA. And uh, but I respect the hell out of you, man. And I, and I, I appreciate I you taking appreciate the time. I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no doubt, man. Anytime you have something, dropping albums, you're gonna drop some videos. You're gonna, you know, what I mean, like you're gonna go on tour. I, I don't know what's wrong, what's up with you. Uh, but you let me know, and I'll definitely we'll figure share. it out, bro. Yeah, I appreciate you. I'll spread you, the man. love, man. Anytime. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, please, thank you so much. All right, brother. You can hang out in the background or just cut out and enjoy your day, man. I appreciate All right, cool. you. All right, brother. thank you, bro. Yeah, man. Peace. There you have it, Doctor Ian Levy, my man, my mello, just a, a a shining star in this uh, in this field, but also in this whole uh, concept that this show is about. Uh, I don't uh, appreciate many uh, people more than I do him, and I thank him for his time. Uh, you could uh, I didn't ask where people could find you, Ian. You still around? Yeah, I'm here. Tell people where they could find you uh, online, so you can get in contact um, if you know or follow your work. Yeah, so my website is enplevy.com. That's I A N P L E V Y.com. Yeah. Um, and that's also my handle on everything Instagram and, uh, and Twitter. Yeah, it's ENP Levy. So there you go. look me up, come find me. I definitely am down to build, talk, do some work, make some music. Anytime I've asked you a question or got some insight, you've been uh, more than open to it. So I appreciate you for that. No Anything problem, else we didn't talk about? We, we covered it all? We're good? Nah, I think that's it, man. Thank you again. All right, brother. All right, man. All right, thank you. Once again, yeah. Dr. Ian Levy, uh, follow him, follow his work. Check out uh, the work. Uh, check out the work and the music uh, as well. Uh, you know, a lot of us mix uh, our musical interests into our work. You'll find me on Sundays on Bonfire Radio. Check it out. You see I'm wearing a shirt, bonfireradio.com. 
Uh, the Sunday R&B brunch, I'm still a DJ, I still spin, I still bring, uh, I go on a musical journey, 40 years or so, maybe 50 sometimes, sometimes I'll start in the, in the 50s, so damn, that's, tell me that's 70 years of music, 70, I keep saying 40 or 50, decades worth of musical uh, history, classic soul R&B on Bonfire Radio, so we like to mix our musical uh, and and uh, interests and talents in what we do, Dr. Ian Levy, not only helping young people on the school counseling tip and helping teach. He's acclaimed for it. This is 2016 New York State School Counselor of the Year. I don't think we, we mentioned that, uh, but helping young people and telling us how we can help young people as well through, uh, you know, a hip hop guided approach. Uh, and I love it. I love the work. I love the work. I know it works. You know, I know it works. Like I said, my kids are, you know, we're going through it right now with everything and, you know, Yeah, I, I worry. Uh, uh, it's a it's a personal side note, you know. what I mean, like I, I don't want to. It's not about this thing isn't centered on me. Um, but I get all the issues. I understand them. I do what I can. My work speaks to social justice issues. My other podcast, this, all that. Um, my kids are black, you know. What I mean, they're old. They're they're of age. Um, and I know the pressures, whether they wear it on their sleeves or if it's bundled inside. And I just know that that happens exponentially and so widespread among our uh, among communities um that we care about i'm not necessarily you know of but i'm you know adjacent in some ways and i just can't imagine and i it, it hurts my soul um but uh i know that folks like uh dr levy and uh dr ajapong who he mentioned with the with these these thoughts in mind are reaching so many young people and doing so much good and you don't have to be a a, a mental health therapist or a counselor to understand that this is uh, eddie i see you eddie in the chat and eddie says listen I, I do this with my son i always ask him what he's listening to or what he feels or what he thinks the lyrics are about and eddie are you talking about x because that young man has a wide range of musical interests uh from all across the spectrum but that's the thing it's just that simple it's just that simple. Find out what your kids are into. Don't dismiss it. Don't laugh it off. Don't, you know, I used to have big debates with my dad, who again was a sociology professor, uh, but he also liked jazz and hip hop and uh, jazz and blues and doo-wop and such. And I learned a lot from his musical tastes. And I think I was getting through to him about mine over time. Uh, I would love if he was around today. Distinguished professor of sociology would love, you know, and it's funny, I, I again, I'm getting personal now. I look back at some of his papers as I got older. I'm, I'm now for fun. I read like journal papers and and stuff about the intersection of hip hop. But my dad was a sociologist, and his study, his fields was urban studies and sociology of minorities for many many years. And I look back at one of his papers in like 1976, and he was writing some response to teachers that were. Uh, kind of told to go teach in uh, sort of a minority community, uh, an inner city school at the time, and their reflections on sort of why it didn't work and why they weren't given the tools to succeed. They were given the, they were charged with this, you know, go in and, and fix up these kids. And they were like, okay, we want to do some things like this. And it wasn't that spelled out, but it, it was really kind of the basis, what I now understand to be cultural relevancy cultural responsiveness. They're like, we can go into the school and we can talk to the kids, but if the school environment, if the school administration, if the school structure is still set in the, in, in the ways that don't give those young people the respect due for who they are and what they're about, then there's only so much I can do. I don't care how good my intentions are. I can't operate under the constructs of what you're telling me my frameworks have to be. And he wrote about this. My dad wrote about like 1976 or 1978. And so I realized that this is not new. This is not uh, brain science, like brain, what do you call it? Uh, this is not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. Uh, that this has been talked about and thought about. We had Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings on this podcast, who was the OG of this movement. Um, and, and many others that say, look, it's real simple. You can't treat all young people with the same brush. Where they come from, their communities, their cultures, their cultural influences, the stressors on their life. It's all different. It's all different. You can't just 
whitewash everything. So what Dr. Levy and others tell us in the education and the counseling fields is that if you just do this, if you just have this framework, you don't have to be always of the community. It helps. Uh, you have to be respectful of the community. You have to be understanding of the community. You have to meet students halfway, young people halfway, meet them where they are. And I asked him at the end, and, and he gave us a great anecdote about parents. Parents are teachers now. Parents are, you know, shouts to Mrs. Faces, uh, by the way, because every day, baby girl Faces, who y'all know, because she's a star, uh, has the, the, online counsel, uh, the online distance learning. She's in kindergarten. She's doing wonderfully. Her teachers are great. The school is set up well. I'm happy with the process. I do this show around midday. She's doing schoolwork around midday. Mrs. Face is holding down. But Mrs. Faces works a full-time job. And even though I do this show, I still have a full-time job. Shouts to all the podcast editing and podcast producing that I do. And, you know, shouts to my other clients and, you know, and family. But that we can't now, of, of all times, when pandemic and changes to our lifestyle and social interaction is all down. And social justice and, you know, all these other issues are way up. The political thing, forget it, don't even get me started. It's, it's scary. I think it's scary for anyone. It's particularly scary for people on this side of justice. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This side of history. Scary for all of us. Some more than others. You know, some who can't pretend or, you know, can't walk down certain streets and be okay. I can, and I, I accept that. I understand that. But I get it. So if you have a way to communicate with your young people that could be helpful, open them up a little bit, give them some sense that it's not, as he said in the interview, as Dr. Levy said, that it's not them. It's not you. It's not you. I'm telling you, I tell my kids, it ain't you. I don't care what this world tells you. You're a black, beautiful kings, queens. I, you know, I don't care what this world tells you. I'll take and I'll, I'll, I'll take a bullet if I have to. But if we can also let them see that this is not them, let them see that there's a, a way to kind of process this a little bit better uh, through parental intervention. I hope if you're listening to the end and you didn't catch that, you go back and listen. I think it's valuable. And folks like Dr. Levy are finding ways to do it. Dr. Ajapan, uh, his partner, we didn't talk about the uh, the hip-hop um, uh, book series. So again, you could be a teacher, you could be an educator, you could, the hip-hop ed uh, book series. You could be an educator, you could be a mental health counselor, a mental health professional, and take value in these conversations that we're having. It's the world's smartest hip-hop podcast. We're brainy. We talk about these things. But if you're a parent, if you're just a folk Regular, everyday, regular, degular, you know, I just want to try to find out what's bothering my kid. I'm telling you when I tell you, years ago, I wish I had these tools. And so, you know, listen, try it out. Reach, reach out to Dr. Levy. He'll, he'll, he'll give you some insight on Twitter. Follow the Hip Hop Ed Chat. They talk about these things a lot. So the intersection of hip hop and education. Dr. Levy's an active participant in that. Hashtag Hip Hop Ed every Tuesday, 9 o'clock on Twitter. It's an hour-long Twitter chat. So if you follow the hashtag, do a search for the hashtag, you'll get uh, all this interaction. So anyway, uh, just a fascinating subject. I love talking to Dr. Levy. I love the work he does. Thank you all for paying attention. Once again, shouts to Cindy. Shouts to Eddie. Shouts to Jay. Shouts to Jay. Uh, a couple of Jay. Shouts to Natalie Crew. Shouts to everyone who's been checking in and, and peeping this. Again, we went long with this one. Uh, but man, in this day and time, it's urgent. So we'll be turning this around on, onto the podcast feed as quick as possible. In the meantime, in between time, check out some old episodes of Hip Hop Can Save America, the podcast, either from this live series being done in September 2020 uh, or past episodes. Again, go listen to Ian Levy's original uh, interview. It's just as insightful. We covered a lot of stuff that really gets to the, the nitty gritty of, of, of why this uh, type of counseling works. Uh, and then check out all the other amazing people that I've been just blessed and honored to talk to. Uh, follow us on all the socials, Hip Hop Advocacy uh, or Manny Faces or Manny Faces NY on Instagram. Just Google the thing you're looking for us on and then that thing. So Center for Hip Hop Advocacy, Twitter, you'll, you'll find us. Uh, and then of course, we'll be back Monday for the last three days of September, the last three days of the live edition of Hip Hop Can Save America. I do implore you, if you find this inspirational, if you find this uh, helpful or just interesting or just you just dig it, patreon.com slash Manny Faces. Uh, really, you know, $3 a month, $5 a month, doesn't matter, whatever it is. 
uh, it goes to help doing this. I, I took this on in September and wanted to do it and see where it would go. And it's been absolutely fantastic so far. And uh, I'd like to find ways to continue to do it. That, that, that requires me to pay for all the fancy pants uh, equipment and subscriptions and assistance and subscription services. You know, these things all cost money, but I want to do it right. I don't want to ever do it low budget because when we represent hip hop, I don't know about the rest of the world, but when Manny Faces represents hip hop, it's done professionally, it's done with integrity, and it's done with dignity and respect of the participants and uh, practitioners and uh, those who call themselves hip hop. This is Hip Hop Can Save America. I'll be back Monday. Stay tuned to the podcast feed, wherever you subscribe to podcasts, hiphopcansaveamerica.com for that information. And uh, we'll dro- I'm going to drop something this weekend for sure, maybe two. Maybe two. I owe you some. And we're still catching up with this week's episodes. Listen, it's a lot of work. Just give me, cut me some slack, damn it. Uh, anyway, reach out to me if you have any comments, suggestions, questions, or uh, uh, indictments or praise. I'll take praise. I need those affirmations. See, man, Manny faces. And um, no justice, no peace. Uh, justice for Breonna Taylor uh, and the long list of names. Uh, if you follow the Newsbeat podcast, a sponsor of this show, you'll see we did an episode recently called Say Her Name, uh, where we already uh, recognized, called out, and uh, broke down 400 years of state violence against black women and girls in America. Uh, so we've seen this coming, and we uh, shed light on it, and we talk about it in our own way. And uh, shout out to all the artists and people involved with the Newsbeat podcast for, uh, for taking on these issues when it's not in vogue. You know, we talk about it no matter what. Anyway, that's it. I'm out of here, y'all. I appreciate y'all. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for checking me out. Uh, it really gives me a lot of uh, a lot of hope uh, that uh, we're uh, onto something and that we could take it somewhere and uh, impact more lives. So thank you. I love y'all. I'll talk to y'all soon. All right, peace.